Namaskar. Nelson Mandela once said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. In GSFC University, we all believe the same that if you want to change the world, first change yourself with the power of knowledge. A very good morning to one and all present here. I, Sneha Bajaj, Assistant Professor English and Soft Skills, would like to extend a warm welcome to yet another mega talk on riding a wave of new generation, huge challenges in the mega talk series, Kshitij, knowledge sharing through engaging talks and immersive joy of learning. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker of Kshitij mega talk series of today, Sri Ajit Telangshar. I also like to welcome Sri Vishal Sri Dharankar, Sri Dumal sir, Sri Chandra sir, both the madams who have accompanied sir. Okay. I like to welcome our uh, professor, Dr. Nikhil Zaveri, assistant director of the university, Sri Mahesh Parut, all the teaching and non teaching faculties, all the deans and associate deans of all the schools and my dear students. It is my privilege to introduce all of you, the chief guest of the event, Sri Ajit Dilangsa, a renowned Reiki master who is well known as Guruji in his circle. Born in Mumbai, he got his education from premier education institutions like Ram Mohan English School, Elphinstone College and Institution of Science, Mumbai. He has several postgraduate degrees like Masters in Chemistry with a specialization in nuclear and radiochemistry from Institute of, of Science, Master in the Management with specialization in Marketing from Jamnalal Bajaj Institution of Management Studies, Mumbai. He worked in industries like Tata's and Mafat Lal, where he got vast experience of metals, plastics, and polymers. And he started his own professional consultancies in the name of Synergesic in 1985. And he has performed more than 150 projects in India, as well as the other country like USA, UK, Switzerland, Singapore, and Australia. He also founded other companies like Golden Edge Software Technologies Private Limited and Synetic Project Consultancies Private Limited. Sri Ajit Telang also taught in several business schools and colleges and started doing his research in spiritual science and become a Reiki master in 1997. He has been teaching Reiki healing techniques and founded Reiki Vidyaniketan and initiated more than 25,000 students all over the world on the path of Reiki and spirituality. Reiki Vidyaniketan is active not only in India, but also in the foreign cities like Chicago, Boston, New Jersey, and California. Sri Telangsa founded Spiritual Outlook for the Management Enterprises Training Series for Corporate Life for the industries like Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, Apollo Tires, Mahindra and Mahindra, to name few industries. He has also authored the books like Inner Celebrations, Rainbow in the Heart, Mirages and Oasis, Lamp Up to Yourself, etc. What a wonderful names and the titles we have this. I, I'm a person of a literature. I just love the title of the books. Okay. Uh, he has also uh, he also writes regular articles in Tathastu and international magazines on spiritual science published in USA. He also launched the program uh, like Responsible Parenting, Spiritual Awareness for the Family Environment, Spiritual Outlook for the Future Times. Uh, and he has also write so many articles which gives the idea of the social upliftments. We are so honored to have you here, sir. Thank you so much for gracing the occasion. Okay. Now, can I request 
डॉक्टर निखिल जवेरी सर टू वेलकम सर विद द फ्लावर्स May I invite Dr. Nikhil Zaveri, sir, the provost of the university, to address the welcome speech. So, good morning, everyone. The speaker of the day, respected Sri Ajit Telangji. my dear colleagues invited guests my dear student friends it's a great pleasure to have a very eminent and accomplished speaker shri telang ji on our campus today you all are aware that kshitij is one of our very recent initiatives where we conduct mega talks by very eminent speakers and the first mega talk was delivered by our own honorable md gsf limited shri mukesh puri ji which was one of the most wonderful talks he talked on economics and he talked on that material prosperity today we are going to have a talk on spiritual prosperity i am using this word very consciously because the topic is like this riding the wave of new generations challenges and opportunities i personally believe that you can take up the challenges in life only when you are spiritually prosperous material prosperity does help but i think the success lies in having spiritual prosperity and if we can bring in that element into our regular system of education then probably we will be succeeding in our mission so i am sure that today i had a very little and brief interaction with shri telang ji and he has so many things to talk about and we are going to be very much enlightened with his talk today it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to our university and i welcome you on behalf of my students and my faculty over here and uh, i am sure this entire talk would remain an experience in itself so wish you all the best thank you thank you so much sir let's not wait any more moment okay uh, let me invite sir for his speech sir please stage is all yours is it okay yes sir good morning to everybody and first and foremost thank uh, all of you including the gsfc university i am not new to gsfc i have been coming here for the last 7 8 years in some pretext or the other but i'm obviously new to the gsfc university because for the first time i entered into the complex i have been seeing this building from outside so thank you very much sir dr javeri and uh, all of you for inviting me today in a very august forum i'm very happy to see that kshit is in an initiative and i'm probably the second speaker to be on this so thank you i'm already honored and uh, uh, to begin with i mean uh, dr javeri rightly said the first talk was basically about the material spirituality and he said partly rightly that i'm talking about the spiritual uh, prosperity there's a little difference and i'd like to have uh, with deep regards to dr javeri i would like to correct a bit as i understood the life there's nothing spiritual and there's nothing material because there are two dimensions of life they are not the life is only one probably the thoughts are two okay so somewhere when i look at uh, 
the whole model. I mean, it was talked about in how, how I came to spirituality. I worked in corporate for donkey's years, and then I switched over to this path. And a lot of people ask me this question. In fact, the two questions that I need uh, to answer every time I go anywhere. People see you're a nuclear scientist. OK, what happened to you? People feel sad about that. And then I say, I have become a clear scientist. Moving from nuclear to clear, I think it's a big, huge transition in my life. The second thing people say, you are from the corporate world. What happened to you? How do you come to spiritual? How do you balance your life with the material world on one side, the spiritual talks on the other side? And I can't get this uh, question properly because I don't believe there are two. And if there are no two, they cannot, the question of balancing doesn't arise. Are you getting the point? So for balance, you need to, to have to, and I always have believed that this is only one life. If you look at the life, uh, oh, I've no boat to use, right? So anyway, I will just uh, try to make you visualize. Normally, I draw it on the whiteboard. See, there are, if you look at the two approaches, spiritual approach and the material approach, and there are two kinds of, uh, uh, what you can say, attitudes, approaches and attitudes. There are two kinds of attitudes, the material attitude and the spiritual attitude. You know, we normally call it the spiritual world and the material world. If you look to the history so far, right from the mythological days, there are two different kind of uh, dimensions of life which have been talked time and again, these two spiritual and material. If you look at the first model on the Indian cultural scene, spiritual people like all Siddhas, you know, Rushi Munis, wise people, they did a lot. They went to the caves of Himalayas. They sat for years together. They had a penance. And at one point of time, let us believe they went to the moksha or the liberation. They did probably. But directly, if you look at the uh, humanity as it is, there was hardly any kind of influence on the humanity. Hardly anything had changed. So somewhere it has felt this model of spiritual approach for spiritual attitude or spiritual world has not really delivered directly. I'm not uh, doubting. There must be some deep uh, kind of uh, impact on humanity for all those good people have done. But somewhere the model doesn't seem to have worked successfully. The second model adopted by the human civilization, human world, was the material approach for the material attitude, for the material world, you know, which we know has already created a, a walk of the mess in the world. You know, everything is counted in terms of material as if we don't have the spirit at all. And that has actually created more problems to the world than anything else in the life. So that model has also felt badly in making us more happy and uh, uh, healthy, harmonious, the third model, which has been tried for the last few years, few decades rather, bringing the material approach into the spiritual world, you know, like ashrams. There are a number of gurus we can talk about today. I won't name them. But they will have ashram, they will have a number of disciples, they will talk about their money, they talk about, uh, they talk up numbers, in fact, in short. You know. And all that probably they have done is they have brought the material approach into the spiritual world. They are ashrams enough, but they all look to be under the garb of ashram, the corporate world has been run. You know, they talk in terms of numbers. They talk in terms of vastness of the ashram, the numbers of people who attended the satsangs, etc., etc. And somewhere I think people are getting disillusioned in the last about couple of decades, if you look at that. The only one quadrant, you know, if, you, if you have that XY coordinates, the last quadrant, I say the most uh, wonderful quadrant is the fourth quadrant, where the spiritual approach into the material world. You know, whatever you do, even if I, I, I followed that in my life, whatever I did with my customers, there's always a spiritual element. I always thought it was a spiritual movement, talking to the customer, talking to the supplier, talking to the vendor, talking to my colleagues talking to my staff, that's not a single thing I never thought that we are not spiritual. So somewhere imbibing spirituality into day-to-day -day life is the last hope. And if you cannot do it, if the model fails, probably we have no fifth model today available. So it has been my mission for the last about three decades to work into this particular quadrant. And this program is one of the 
manifestations of those missional efforts. Okay, so today I thought I'll talk to you about this particular subject for two reasons. One thing, it is very close to my heart. Right from 2004, I've been working on research on this particular subject. And I would like to present some of the findings, present some of the experiences that we all gone through. My colleague, uh, Kurupa Choksi and Ashwini Telang, we have a small team with Vishal here. We have been working relentlessly on this particular uh, issue on the new generation. And I'll give you a brief uh, background about what happened. I used to go uh, to USA and other countries on this uh, spiritual teachings. And one of the meetings, one of the visits that I had in Chicago, I happened to be staying with the Indian family, very well-to-do family, educated family, the husband and the wife from the beautiful culture. And they had a son, seven years old son. And one day I was just relaxing in my room, reading something, and I heard some big noise in the house with only three people in the house out of which uh, husband must have gone for a job. So with two people at home, I thought, what this noise is about? And when I came out, I realized a small child of seven years old was threatening, threatening his own mother with a knife in the hand and saying that if you talk a single word, I'll kill you. And I was not I was new to these kind of reactions. Somewhere I, I didn't know what to do in this situation. I was a guest and I was wondering what will happen. But, but that said the motion, that said the motion of my thoughts. I thought something is different with this generation. And that was the first spark you know, which actually helped me to get into this subject, do a research. We did research with 10,000 students and parents all over the world and came out with the finding, which is something really, something uh, phenomenally revolutionary, which I'd like to present with you. Riding the wave of new generation challenges, and then I've added an opportunities also. Because every challenge is an opportunity if you are empowered to manage the challenge. No, otherwise it's a risk, otherwise it's a threatening. It's a threat. So somewhere challenges are nothing but the situations. Now, I won't call the word challenges and problems because these words are so loosely used. And a lot of people say we have a problem today and I don't understand what problem exactly means. If you look at a small guy going to the school at the age of four or five, comes home and tells the mother, mother, there was a problem at school today. What kind of a problem a small child of four years face? You know, but still, people use the word problem. The young people have the problem. The small children have the problem. The old people have the problem. Everybody talks the problem. But somewhere we fail to understand problem is nothing but a situation which you cannot manage. Arjuna had a problem in the Mahabharata. Suddenly, when he stood there and Krishna said, Pasha, Shaitani Arjuna. And suddenly, he developed a problem. And he said, Lord Krishna, there's a problem. There was actually a problem means there was some situation which was which was larger than Arjuna's abilities. When the situation around is more than what you can chew or more than what you can meet, you call it a challenge. And the moment that problem was there, all, all that Lord Krishna did, he did not change the environment at all. He changed Arjuna, transformed Arjuna, and the problem was over. So challenge is nothing but a larger problem which we have never faced before. And that's why I use the word challenges and also opportunities, because if we know what the challenge is, and if you know what we are, probably the challenges are no longer challenges. They're the opportunities for us to grow on the path of humanity. Let us go. I mean, can we, uh, can, I can change here itself, right? Okay. Why it is so relevant to talk uh, in this world about in this forum? Yeah, thank you. Yeah about this particular uh, issue because India is going to be, India is right, I'm not going to say going to be, is the least young country in the world, largest young country in the world. You know? By 2030, India will be amongst the youngest nations in the world. India will be the third largest country to offer higher education in science and technology in the world, next only to USA and China. This provides an exciting proposition for the great country of India to make one's head and the national flag to raise high with a lot of pride. See, the process has started in 2020. And between 2020 and 2050, India is going to, for 30 years, India is going to be the largest young population in the world, youngest country in the world. You know, which means there are two possibilities. If we cannot 
understand and cannot manage this generation probably will go to the bottom bottomish part of the life and if you can manage this situation we are going to the number one country in the whole uh, universe so this is something so relevant to india you know that's why i have taken this subject and most of you in the university are young people so i'm going to talk about your story when i talk about you and tell you exactly what my findings have about you i also look to you as some kind of a feedback i would need from you people you know because the research never ends research starts and what i'm trying to tell you is some story which started happening in 1985 86 i just narrated one story in chicago what happened but that is not a isolated unique kind of a piece wherever i go and wherever i see in this last uh, almost 17 18 years since we started this research we find it's a universal phenomenon it's not about india it's not about america it's not about britain it's not about australia or pakistan it's about the universal phenomenon we are talking about and i'm going to reveal you certain thing because you know what happened is during our research we identified 28 personality traits which are so different than the earlier generations ever who have taken birth on this earth no somebody you need to understand what's happening so it is said that the human uh human nature dna you know dna is a very deoxyribose nucleic acid it's a very important aspect of human life it provides the human dimension it provides itself into an exp- expresses itself into five dimensions like physical or biological secondly emotional mental spiritual and intellectual so all five dimensions of human life are emanating from one small dna so that dna structure decides the quality of the generation and about the dna as dna activists know very well dna scientists know very well it is believed that every 26000 years the human dna changes the structure changes the first time it happened was about 26000 years ago if you look at the human history when humans were actually a cave men they used to stay in the caves and they were very primitive they were not as advanced as we think we are today so somewhere that the first change happened when the second strand see normally generally they are say that there are 12 strands of dna out of which only two were known not till about long ago till about 20 30 years ago we believed that there are two dna strands and all the other 10 are junk they call junk dna that's the beauty of the modern science if you don't know the use of certain thing call it a junk so all these dna activists started believing that's a junk dna which has been there and this doesn't make any significant difference to the world at all unfortunately for them and fortunately for the humanity suddenly it was realized that 1985 86 those 26000 years have practically ended around that 5 10 years here and there you cannot be so precise to the year so somewhere they realized that the dna of the young generation is so different than ever before in the last 26000 years and if you look at uh, our own uh, life in the last many thousand years the systems the biological system like medical system the judiciary system the education system all these are systems and all these systems have been designed established proven and we are perfectly in the slot provided to us in the last 26000 years and for the first time it started happening that some may the design a change and the implications of that in human life started changing drastically more so since 2000 1985 the first year probably when it was noticed that something is changing so let's go to the next one and say the key issues why i'm talking about because the change today's youth is not yesterday's youth you know so many a times the parents when they talk uh, we had lot of interactions with the parents in the last 18 years and generally the parents always thought that it is a generation gap they are used to that the way my father brought me up all that i have to do bring my child so there's nothing rocket science you know to say that oh, i've got to do something i've got to learn something nobody learned anything my parenting came so naturally for humans and suddenly we have realized at this point of time during this transition the parents have realized that of earlier formula doesn't work in fact not we have we had a meeting with 650 parents in goa a couple of years ago and one lady came to me and she said she is about 64 65 
and she had two children. And she was crying and she said that, look, sir, I mean, our generation is a sandwich generation. I said, what do you call it that? And she said, we got a lot of uh, pressure from our parents. We thought generally, we would pass it on to the next generation. That is what is happening years traditionally. No, datna. They say, our parents ne hame data. So we thought probably hum datenge apne bachon ko. But abhi aisi situation ho rhi hai. Hamne parents se dat kiya, bachon se dat kha rhi hai. For the first time, she said, our generation is watching, which cannot pass on the dat to the next generation. See, that, that speaks a volume. Today, the situation has changed to such an extent with the current youth. And here, on this forum of this university, we are talking of something in the future. Youth and scientific education, the need to understand the phenomenon of youth in its full and holistic perspective is very essential. Youth is a phenomenal energy. Youth is the future of the world. But if we understand them, probably we can give them in the right direction, the direction of progress and growth. In the span of the past three decades in this country, a distinct relationship in stress and criminal acts has been found out. And I'm going to cite you some uh, data from NCRB, National Criminal Research Bureau. They showed approximately 31 children died by suicide every day, every day, believe me, 2020, with a total of 11,396 deaths across this year. This is an 18% increase from 9,613 such deaths in the 2019 this increased rate in 2020 is a dramatic rise compared to the suicide rate among children during the past five years. In fact, Nimhans is one of the large uh, uh, body of repute, National uh, Institute of Mental Health and Sciences. They're one of the premier institutions. I was reading the statistics. They said 1917, 145,000 children committed suicide in India alone. And if you look at the 70 years before that from the independence, probably we had never crossed one lakh figure. So this kind of a jump from less than a lakh, and, and it's consistently 2016, 17, and 18, we have not come down less than one lakh 40,000. In fact, I had the pleasure of meeting the education minister of this state of Gujarat four years ago. They had invited us to understand this problem because that particular year in 2017 or 18, in Gujarat, in Surat alone, after the uh, 10 standard results were announced, 45 children committed suicide on one particular day after the results. And that was alarming for the government. And then I had the pleasure of talking to 30,000 teachers in Gujarat state alone on this issue for about two lectures I had on the BISAC. So according to the WHO every year, I mean, let's just talk to the world phenomenon. Almost 1 million people die from suicide and 20 times more people attempt suicide. A global mortality rate of 16 per 1 lakh on one, or one death every 40 seconds and one attempt every 3 seconds on average. Now, this is what is happening to the young generation. Let's go to the growing depression and crimes. And the situation is extremely alarming. I'm going to give you some statistics before I tell you about the personality traits that I have found. In the earlier study, it was found that 20% of the children had subclinical depression, which means they're almost depressed, and about 30% in mild to moderate depression. Here, about 800 students took part in the survey. Government of India had to redefine the term of juvenile crime after Nirbhaya rape case, which rocked the country. I think it was about 2013-14. The incidence of violence, the rapes, crimes of mass killing does not reflect a great hope about the younger generation. In fact, a juvenile crime has offered a great challenge to the judiciary world over. You know, in fact, I had uh, some meetings, special meetings with the High Court judges in Ahmedabad, Gujarat State High Court judges. And one thing I could realize that what is really bothering them, how to manage the juvenile crime. I met one boy in Baroda, one of the remand homes, 13 years old boy. He has already uh, committed four murders. Where will he keep them? In Pakistan, they had a problem. 10 years boy had already committed about 16 killings, 16 murders. And none of the constitution the world over really know how to, how to tackle this. You know, because somewhere I think the constitution doesn't provide, constitution has never taken the cognizance of the fact that anybody less than 18 years of age can commit these kind of crimes at all. So increasing crimes on the juvenile screen, I think is something which one needs to be really worried about. The human restructuring, I'll come back to where I started. 
DNA scientists and spiritual scientists believe that the previous cycle of 26,000 years ended around 1980, as I said, 85, 86. This possibly means that children born post-1980 have a different DNA composition. The change has caused changes in the emotional structure, mental structure, intellectual structure, and even biological structure of these generations. We'll, we'll see in detail what it means literally. Let me come back to most common traits of new generation children. This is the finding I would like to present in front of you. And I think many of you seem to be from that generation. Most of you do, marrying few. And just correct me if I'm wrong, okay? I'm giving you your profile. They come into the world with a feeling of royalty, don't you? I have been talking to the parent. The parent said, for example, a family growing now, and they don't have a vehicle, so they always think about what vehicle we can have in this family. And the guy, a small child, says, you know, you should have a BMW. <laughs> they never start. We always started with the cycle. <laughs> Now, somewhere I think they have, they feel they deserve. Basically, if you look at the new generation, what is amazing, they think their life is a right. And we thought the life was a blessing. So if they get anything, they think they, they were bound to get it. <laughs> they, just, they have a right to leave. They have a right to, I mean, having given a birth, you have got to provide them everything because the kings and the queens of the world, you know, they deserve. We never thought we deserved if somebody praised us for something good that we did, we're a little shy about taking it. Oh, we, I don't really deserve this. I think you're overdoing this. And these children today, they say, that's it. Okay, that's found. <laughs> There's nothing great. So they don't get appreciated. They don't, they don't get motivated by appreciation. And if you look at the education world, education world always works on two major tools of teaching. One is appreciation or rewards. And secondly, punishment. Today, of course, you know that the constitution doesn't avoid the punish, I mean, doesn't allow you to punish. So that tool is already ineffective. And the recognitions and appreciation are no longer motivation because they think they deserve it. See, they can motivate somebody who thinks that I don't deserve it. <laughs> That's the whole idea of motivation. That's the whole science of motivation. So they come with the feeling of royalty. They have a feeling of deserving to be here and a surprise when others don't share that. So they get surprised. <laughs> Then you say that, oh, my boy, I mean, you don't deserve it. I mean, I have seen some people. A guy, you know, just suddenly say that. I, I went to U.S. and there was a small guy about eight years old. And uh, I, I love to play carom. And uh, I was wondering what games I can play in U.S. because it was a winter time. And the boy says, well, I'm a champion. You can play with me. And I was a little taken aback. I thought, my God, I mean, I'm going to face a tough competition today. When I sat to play with him, he actually didn't know anything about it. And he believed that he's a champion carom. He made that statement so casually and so seriously at the same time. You know, I was a little rattled, but I didn't know. I mean, uh, they have this habit. They over oversell themselves. They have some ideas which are actually not. They, they the, I think only the ideas, but not the reality. They have difficulty with absolute authority, authority without explanation of choice. You know? So they have some problems with the authorities. They don't believe in hierarchy. They don't believe in authority. In fact, you know, I have been coming to Gujarat for almost 1997 onwards, so it is about 26 years, practically every month. And I have more than about 8,000 to 9,000 students only in uh, Gujarat and Baroda and Ahmedabad, basically. So these young children who were, were children when I started coming here, they already gone into the youth and they come to meet me. And that's a very typical scene. They have just graduated. They've just become engineer, either mechanical, electrical. So I normally ask them, I say, what do we do? What will you do now? I said, I'll start a business. I said, at the age of 21, you want to start a business? Yeah. I said, why don't you take a job? No, no, I can't work under boss. No, they just don't want to work under boss. I said, but look, I mean, why don't you look at the job as an extension of your study? Three years, five years. No, this is how we grew. I worked in industry before I started something on my own because I was enriched with experiences. I was enriched with how to treat people, how to talk to the people, how to react. All those things, education, which generally universities fail to give. No, so universities extension is your job. So you're going to learn. It's still a learning opportunity. They don't believe they can learn because they don't want to report to anybody. So somewhere I think they have an absolute authority. They have a problem. No, in our, our time in a school, for example, our teacher says the principal has called you. No, we would literally sweat under the collars. 
my God, what will happen? They will restricate me. What have I, what have I done? Today's children, if you tell them, the principal has called, say, let's go. They're very happy. <laughs> and they will sit in front of them. They will not be standing in front of them. I've seen n number of times. They will not even stand. They will just so, so pull up the chair. They will sit and say, yeah, what's the matter? We didn't have that kind of guts. They simply will not do certain things. For example, waiting in line is difficult for them. They just don't wait. For example, there's a queue for the taxis or something. They will not wait. Or there's a queue for the bus. They will not wait for the bus. After five minutes, they have hardly a patience. The patience that my generation showed, and probably some of your generation showed, they don't have that kind of patience. They get impatient very fast. No? So somewhere, if you look at that, they uh, simply will not do certain things. In fact, you know, it has um, impacted the uh, business to a great extent you know, on the retail. No, you know, going to the malls, we thought probably it was very popular among this generation. But they have stopped going to the malls in a large way. Because the buying becomes fast. But then actually paying for the what you have bought, it takes a long time because of queues. So what they have decided to do, they have switched over to the digital or online kind of ordering. So they simply will not start doing that. The fifth one, they get frustrated with systems that are ritual oriented and don't require critical creative creative thoughts. And let me let me make it clear. Here I'm not trying to find out the blames or find out the uh, weaknesses or, or I'm not passing any judgment. As a researcher, I'm just trying to state certain things which have been noticed, which have been found out. So that doesn't mean they are bad or they are good. I'm not reaching at that conclusion at all. No, because basically, I think that is the major mistake we do as our generation. Oh, these people are good for nothing. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you there's a difference between how we thought, how we lived, and how they are living. So somewhere I'm trying to bring it out, a reality which is there for us to face and to make a life a better proposition. They get frustrated with systems that are ritual-oriented and don't require creative thoughts. If the creative thought is not there, they cannot create something, they cannot repeat certain things. You know, so somewhere, I think, if you look at the religion part of it, especially temples and the churches and the mass, they hardly visit. They don't like to go in the same rituals over and over again because they feel it's a nonsense, unless explained. And that is a huge challenge for these spiritual teachers also. In fact, you know, I love to talk to these generations because there's so much in the ritual, so much science which is hidden in the ritual. Now, for the simple reason, let me know, that uh, when we talk about uh, particular science, when you talk of any uh, vidya, you've got to go through three phases. You know, First is the principle, secondly process, and the third is application. No, no teachings can happen without these three. Unless you tell them the principle, people will not go to the process. They will not understand the process. And once the principle and processes are apply applicable, applied, they can use it in their day-to-day -day life. So somewhere, I think over a period of time, the principles become redundant. For example, mobile. How many people today who are using mobile really know the technology of mobile? They don't have to. You just press a button, you get a call, you press a button, you switch off the call. I mean, this is as simple as that for them, for the user. Maybe 95% of the people, users of mobile may not know the basic technology. They don't have to. So I think same thing happened to most of the systems which are created in the past uh, few decades, a few centuries. So somewhere there, they don't like uh, to follow certain things because their parents have followed. And I'll tell you a simple thing. A lot of people who learned under me 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they're already in the 60s, 50s and 60s. They have their children, they have their grandchildren. So they come to me and they go to me with a lot of respect. I mean, they don't have to necessarily. But I'm just giving you the matter of fact. But the child who comes to come with him, he doesn't. And the parents, you know, literally force them. And I said, don't do that. Because he has no reason or she has no reason to bow. Because we have no relationship. So with the spiritual knowledge and spiritual practices that we undergone together with the earlier generation, they may have a reason to respect me. The children do not. You know, in fact, I'll give you one example. I was in Bangalore a few years ago. And I happened to, it was my pleasure to teach one of the uh, business uh, wizards. So he was very thrilled and he, I'm proud that he's on the spiritual path with me. He took me to his home and he had a 15 year old young girl. So he just called her. I was sitting in the living room. He called her. He introduced me. She came. She said hi and she went away. 
And the next day for the next program, the next morning we had a program. This guy came with a small face and a sullen voice. And I asked him, is, is your health okay? He said, yeah. Then I said, why look very down today? He says, my daughter inserted you. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned. He says, last night they could not sleep. I said, what do you mean she inserted me? He says, though she said hi and she went away. I thought she would sit, she would take your blessings, she would talk to you, get some knowledge. I said, that was your idea of respect. Their idea of respect is different. I don't think she dis she dis disrespected. She said hi to me itself is a big obligation to me. She had a reason not to say, I mean, she had no reason to say hi either. She could have just looked at me or even not look at me and walk away. She could do it. Their, uh, their whole idea of respecting somebody is so different than my generation. And unfortunately, we are trying to pass a judgment with respect to our references. Their references are so different. And that's not wrong. Let me repeatedly say, I'm not criticizing the new generation. I'm just trying to understand why one does what they do. Are you reading this point? Many a times, you know, the people say that their reaction time, they react instantaneously, spontaneously. They don't care who you are. You know, and that is something which is creating a lot of flair in the world today. They just react. We never. In fact, I was reading a book in psychology. They say in the earlier times also, when we were going through our 20s and 30s of life, we are all, uh, what you can say, terrorists in our own sense. No, we feel that we have to fight against injustice. The whole idea of justice, injustice, fighting, fight against the system, anti-establishment, every generation has gone through. It's not different, not new. But what used to happen, supposing I have to fight against something, it happened to me in my life. And I thought I should break a law because the law is not right. But then the second thought which would come to me, if I break a law, what will happen? They will put me in jail, maybe for a day, maybe for two days, maybe for three days. I mean, this is not a serious crime. Something I protested and they put me into jail. But what will happen to my family? If I go to jail, what would they talk about my father? He's a father of somebody who was jailed. And that actually made us withdraw. You know, that thought of what may happen, the implications of my actions. Not that we did not think of this kind of violent reactions. I'm not suggesting that. But every time we thought of violent reaction, we did not translate that, manifested that into an action because there was a reaction time we had. Okay, we, have, we had something like 10 to 15 seconds to think before we acted. Today's generation does not do that and that is not their fault again. I'm defending them today. For the simple reason, you know, I, we got the answer and we were so excited. Our team was conducting this uh, program in Austin, not Austin, Dallas, Dallas in Texas, in USA. And we had some uh, neurologists there. Okay. And this is the first time I'm sharing this knowledge openly. And uh, one of the neurologists, you know, he got excited when he heard all these things, you know, when we talked about this, how their traits have changed. He says, my God, that gives me some uh, idea about what is happening. And then he told me that he has been doing research right from last uh, 10 years, 1984 onwards, as a neurologist to find out, see, they have found out something unique. They say between the two hemispheres, there's something like corpus corollum in the brain. And the corpus corollum till about 1985, 86 something, had one small projection of three to five millimeters, which was not known exactly the function of that particular part. No, they thought it was just left out there and how does it work? What does it function? What does it play a role in humanity, human life? They didn't know. And suddenly what has happened is since 1985-86, as reported by a neurologist, that part is missing. So it's not only a structural change in real senses, even a physiological change. The brain has gone through some changes. And if it, they don't have that kind of reaction of 10, 10 seconds, they are not responsible. Their spontaneity, their spontaneous, their volatile reactions are basically coming from their design, which they cannot change. We were designed that way. They are designed this way. Are you getting this point? So somewhere, they seem to be system busters, non-conforming to any system and do things their own way. That's why most of the young generation doesn't like to go to the institution like school and colleges. The schools are really coming into problems. And the corona has added a great deal to that particular thing. You know, that actually created a habit of not going to the school. Somewhere they have realized that in the school they cannot learn anything. They know. They know a lot. And school cannot really add to something that they don't know about. 
No, so somewhere I think in one particular thing, a professor came to me from Chennai. He said seven hundred children in that that particular school have not come to the school for the last six years at all. They just don't want to. They said, no, no, we don't want to learn. We don't want to come and learn geography and the history and what you are teaching us all these years. And they have rebelled. And this rebellion kind of thing is happening to many schools today. They prefer to be in the company of others with like consciousness and avoid others. So they are loners generally. I don't know how many of you really agree to that. They don't want to mix up with the people they don't uh, gel with. So many a times we, we used to go with our parents and just be a part of the function. I mean, we never enjoyed either. But still, because our parents called us, we had to go. These children have, they would prefer to be at home. They may not prefer to go to the marriages and these other ceremonies we, if they don't know anybody there. No, we were, we were okay. We, we were not very comfortable, but still we did. Uh, they are not sensitive to the reporting to the higher authorities by creating guilt or fear in them. Just as I said, if they used to tell us to go to the principal's office, I think we had a, a real fright. They are not fearful. And even the punishment, you know, if somebody asked us to stand outside the class, you know, and uh, folding your hands and stand like that, it was a big punishment. Everybody used to come and see. Today, these children enjoy that because there's a freedom. <laughs> no, they, they, and they, they, are, they will invite others also to come out. <laughs> are you getting this? Because you know, they don't feel ashamed about it. They don't feel at a punishment at all. So the whole idea of looking to the punishment is so different today. They are not sensitive, so that is what I say. They are not shy in letting you know what they need. They are all very open about it. As I said about BMW, they will, they will be very clear on what they want. No? We used to be a little shy because we used to know our parents do not earn enough to satisfy my desires. So we are something beating around the bush and say, oh, whatever you can afford, give me. Today, if you ask them what you want, they will be very forthright to talk to you. No? So somewhere they are not uh, shy about it. They are wise beyond their years. That's one thing which is beautiful because they are very intellectual. If you look to that changes, if I sum up the, all the changes into small uh, gist or the core of that, is the whole center of human consciousness, human life has shifted from heart to the intellect. You know very well, I mean, there are seven components of the human beings. What are they? The intellect, the mind, the emotions, the body, the memories, the personality, and the soul. Are you getting this? So there are seven components in which through we live life. Unfortunately, what has happened is, unfortunately, what has happened is, today if you look at that, the first one that is uh, intellect, we were not as intellectual as you people are. Honestly, let me, let me conf confess. No? I mean, today I have seen some two and a half years old child decoding or cracking the code of the mobile within no time. I cannot handle that mobile even at this age. After using for 10-15 years, I have to struggle. They do. They, it comes naturally to these children. But they are very weak on mind and they are very weak, even weaker on emotions. And that explains a lot. You know, the biggest challenge, I, I, let me tell you what has happened. The human societies, the civilization that we have formed is based on the family as a unit. If there are no families, there's no society. If there's no society, there's no community. If there's no community, there's no nation. And if there's no nation, there's no world, no civilization. So if you look at the whole idea of civilization, the core point, the center point of the civilization is the family. And the center force of the family is the, rela is the relationship, the emotions. The entire civilization has been based on emotion as a center point. And unfortunately, we are too late to understand that the center point has already shifted to intellect. And we have no model how to rise the civilization, how to face the civilization based on intelligence as a center point. And that is going to be the hugest challenge. Okay? They are wise beyond you. That's why I say they are extremely wise. They are very intelligent. When they decide to solve a problem, they do. But most of the time, they don't. They look to be bored without activities. That is another issue. They cannot, either you see them sleeping or they're working all the time. They, they just can't sit. They just can't sit and contemplate. They just can't sit and introspect. They can't. They can't meditate. That's a problem. 
they show insights about future events in past lives. And there's something very interesting, whether one believes or not believe doesn't matter really. But many a times when we talk to these children at two and a half and three years old, they talk about their past lives to the absolute uh, nitty gritties. They talk about the events which are going to happen as a matter of fact. I was in US, a small boy was there about seven, eight years old, uh, very intelligent, but he was emotionally turbulent. And one lady came, she had a cancer and she was my patient. And she came and told me only three of us are at home. That small boy, myself, that lady sitting, the boy came and sat next to me because he had nothing else to do because his parents had gone out. So I was the one who was looking after him. And that lady said that uh, she brought her reports and said, everything is fine. All my reports are normal. Okay. The cancer is, she's cancer free. And this boy suddenly shot when he had nothing to uh, do actually in the whole matter. He says, madam, your cancer has sprayed into your bones. Go and check up. And he walked out and she did. And she had, how did he know the 10 years boy? How did he know that the patient already has the cancer spread in the bones when the reports were actually not about the bones, but reports said that she is free and she did it proved out to be correct. That kind of wisdom they have, that kind of foresight they have. They are Siddhas, they are super Siddhas. They have a tremendous wisdom and we are not aware about it and they are not aware about it. The biggest part is we are not, none of us really are aware about the realities. Okay, so that is, that is another issue we should be done. They use the term I know more often and sound arrogant for those who do not know about district. Teaching these children is extremely difficult. As a teacher, I can vouch. So try to correct them. They say, I know. Don't mess up. Anything that you say, they say, I know. You know for the simple reason, they have come with their own agenda. And we are not aware about it. They have come with their own goal. So they don't want you to mess up with their design. They don't want to learn anything from you till they want. So teaching these children consciously is a huge task. And we have found out in our own way how to teach them subconsciously through yoga nidra, through some meditative techniques. They learn that way. They learn that way. If you bypass their conscious mind and go through the subconscious mind to their core, they learn. So I think even the teaching methods need to be changed now. Because all those years, the teaching methods have been to address the conscious mind. Are you getting this point? So somewhere I think we need to really find out the different ways. And there are enough ancient ways in the ancient science, ancient life, that they had these ways which were very beautiful and uh, workable. They have imaginary friends, sea angels, deceased people. As I said earlier, that's some kind of a, uh, what you can say, uh, extra uh, sensory perceptions. Exterior perceptions. They are exteriors in that way. You know, they, they can tell you something which is not there. They talk to the people I've seen. I know a guy who was two and a half years old, and his mother told me, suddenly in the midst of the night at about three o'clock, he will wake up, he will sit there and talk in absolute American accent when he was not, uh, not exposed to the America at all at that age. And one day she listened and she, she tried to wake him up. What are you saying? What are you doing? And he said, Don't. Uh, disturb me. I'm teaching these people the Bermuda Triangle. And she had goosebumps. I mean, two and a half years old. He hardly could speak your mother tongue. And he's talking in the chest language, American accent, teaching Bermuda Triangle to somebody which she could not see. So they have got this kind of what normally we would have said weird phenomena, which is not weird. For them, this is a reality. They can see some things which we cannot. So they have some powers of five senses, which probably we are missing. And that is something which you need to tap. You know, because they are the uh, futures. Talk to their pets like they would talk to humans. You know, they love pets more than the humans. <laughs> now, normally, we, when the children come to our camp, you know, and we ask them, who are the people at home? Our teachers. And Kripa Didi was doing that job. And she asked that boy, I mean, how many people at home? He said, five of us. Then she said, who? Father, mother, myself my sister and my brother. Then she said, what are the names of them, your sister? She said, so he said something about the system. And when it comes to brother, he says, Moti, he's a dog. But he's not believing he's a dog. He says, he's my brother. He's a part of the family. They love pets. I've seen these children, they're extremely, uh, care I mean, extremely fair, to the, uh, friendly to the uh, pets, more than probably people at home. 
The next one we'll see is the preferred nature and pets more than people. They're very natural. They're very natural. In fact, you know, we were wondering, uh, we have come out with some education models of our own. One of them is uh, what we call IQ. I would like to say it here on this platform. IQ is a model which we have developed and we have already tested it for education. And that IQ doesn't mean I dot Q dot. It's a I dot K dot E dot W dot. I K E W. I stands for information, K stands for knowledge, E for experience, and W for wisdom. So it is a path of taking children from information to wisdom. That's IQ, technology of education. That's what we have perfected now, and we are doing it in some schools and colleges in Maharashtra and Gujarat also. Now, these children, you know, unfortunately, what has happened because of Google and Internet, etc., all that information they consider to be a wisdom. So that is only an information. So IQ model works on that. What you are today, what you are fed with is information, not the wisdom. Unfortunately, most of the young generation people feel they are already know. They don't know that. No information is like what your vegetable, the raw vegetable your mother brings from the market. It is not eatable for the humans. It needs to be cooked, cooked by the expert expert cook like your mother. And when the mother cooks into the cooked vegetable, that is a second stage of knowledge. Information is transferred to knowledge. The third stage is that you need to experience it. If that vegetable is kept in front of you, you need to test it. That's an experience. And once you test it, it leads to wisdom. It leads to the blood within. Then it becomes a powerful driving force in your life. So somewhere we need to appreciate that we have got to go through these four stages of information, knowledge, experience, and wisdom. Uh, they prefer nature and pets, as I said, have night terrors even before they can start talking. We have seen that uh, till the age of four years, and more so for those students, those, those children who are born with the cesarean C-section, invariably, 95% of the students who are showing these traits, they are all uh, brought to this world by cesarean. And so something unique, I mean, there's a, there's a reasoning for that, with the reasons we can find in Garbhopanishad, which talks about this process of birth. So somewhere we need to believe that these children talk, uh, and then suddenly in the midst of the night they wake up, they start shrieking, they start shouting, they start crying. And at that age probably they don't speak, they don't express themselves properly, so the, most of the parents do not know what is happening to the child. And we had to tell those, we had to counsel those parents saying that don't rush to the mantrik and tantrik, you know, saying that bache ko bhut laga hai, bache ko shrat ko takleef hoti, and don't go by that. That is the natural trait. No, because they don't, rem they remember everything from the past lives, as I said about what they see, something which we don't. So that is something which we'll have to really understand. They show the night terrors because they remember their past births and they cannot express. So the parents will normally say that you listen to them, let them talk whatever they can, respect their stories, you know, don't discard. You know, if you want to really stop that. They show allergies to foods, especially dairy products and sugar. They're very allergic, highly allergic. They're more allergies than probably our generation. They get offended easily. You know, if you try to correct them, if you try to teach them, if you try to say something, if you try to advise them, they get offended. Because every suggestion is taken as a criticism. You know, because they have got their ego on the sleeve. They, they just get hurt. See, you know, something, we used to get sad. They get hurt. That's the difference. If I said something in my childhood and my parents corrected me, they said, no, no, you're wrong. I would feel sad. I would say they're not understanding me. They don't believe me. And about three, four days, we'll not talk. We'll protest. We'll not talk to the mother. On the fourth day, we are back to the stream because we're sad. These children, they get instantaneously, they get hurt. Are we this? And there's a huge difference between hurt and being sad. The reactions are coming out of hurt. Our reactions came from the sadness. So many a time the relationship broken at the spur of the moment. Uh, can get seizures easily till the five years. That's another thing which we have found. Many parents in, inform us, tell us about the children. In the first five years, they get seizures. They get a very high temperature, 104, etc. And they have that kind of seizures that gives a lot of anxieties to the parents but which is very, very natural, that doesn't last beyond five years. They can get high fevers easily because of sensitive systems suspected to have lesser impurities, immunities. Their immunities are very low as compared to us. 
when they fall sick you know the first thought that comes to their mind is a death mai mar raha hu i'm dying now this is something which we have seen very very common they are very sensitive to the sickness small sickness small hurt small wound makes them react extremely on the other side i think we took our wounds in our stride so some way i think that is one thing which you will have to see and the doctors confirm that they they don't get by 98 99 100 101 they don't go gradually on temperature they suddenly shoot to 104 103 high temperature so some way that is a normal trait for them they can be distracted easily and hence cannot concentrate on one task for long no that is something which you will have to and i'll tell you what it means in terms of spiritual uh, approach they get distracted easily they can't concentrate in one thing for after 15 minute they get bored and that is another challenge to the education system see our generation said 30 or 45 minutes as a span of attention so the classes used to be about 45 minutes no these children cannot concentrate for more than 15 minute because their span of attention has dropped down and there are a number of theories working on that they say that the whole time dimension in the universe has changed our bahya rhythm in our generation was 24 hours circadian rhythm their rhythm is 13 and 1/2 hours so they get suddenly they feel hungry suddenly they feel sleepy maybe in the class they feel very sleepy they cannot concentrate and that's not their fault again because we have to understand the basic design we cannot pass the judgment based on our references we have to pass the judgment based based on totality what is happening exactly they are very stubborn in attitude once they say they something it's very difficult to take them away they will say, they will keep on sticking to their own opinions prone to insomnia generally they tend to sleep late most of the parents have reported most of the students have reported, they cannot sleep till 3 o'clock in the month three almost like that they cannot sleep the way you and me probably used to sleep 10 30 11 jaldi soye jaldi uthe early to rise and early to wake that's what i was early bird kind of they don't believe in that because they can't they are insomnic you know they get to sleep very late they will have a midnight midnight uh, uh, what you can say midnight midnight food 12 o'clock they feel hungry by that time we were in deep sleep are you getting this some these children cannot sleep and most of the parents have this problem that they are awake till 2:30 3 they wake up at 10 30 again there's some difference between our circadian rhythm and their circadian rhythm uh they're prone to insomnia as i said they're prone to anxiety or unfounded fears they suddenly they go get into some nervousness suddenly they go into some kind of a stress level they suddenly become high and they cannot explain there are some fears which are not expressible they don't know about it their subconscious mind very friendly but do not have many close friends they are very friendly i mean i'm not saying they are friendly but they don't have a close friend the way we had they will not share everything about their life to somebody they don't usme bahut kanjus hai they will not share their emotion because emotionally they are extremely weak they themselves cannot handle the emotions are you getting this find solace in being alone generally avoid the crowd no they generally avoid the crowd they like to be alone they are the loners by nature give them one mobile and give them some food to eat every day i think they'll be extremely happy they avoid social contacts and that is something which is uh, this is something analysis of what we say 23 uh, different parameters we analyze and if you can see uh, various things you know not many close friend i just said 58.46% reported that way so let's go to the what does it mean what does it mean to us you and me as a society as an education institute as a uh, social activist appreciation is taken as a right while punishment and criticism as a demotivator the age old establishment and successful model of carrot and stick or punishment and reward may not work in future so this is what i think we'll have to keep in focus our whole idea of motivation the theories of motivation need to be rewritten are you getting this conviction about a life being a situation of abundance where everything that is needed is easy level they, they believe in abundance now maybe may, many of you must be seeing children around many of you yourself are young people when they finish their work when they finish their work on their computer and they go out do they switch off the computer do they switch off the lights do they switch off the fans they will keep everything as it is and go away their parents have to follow them and see that oh now the light has to be switched off 
fan has to be switched out, the door has to be closed, AC has to be switched off. Everything is done by the parents. When you ask these children, they say, why are you making you and cry about it? It's happened and they, they can't believe everything is scarce. Our generations are babies of scarcity and these are the babies of abundance. They think everything is abundant. You're making bones for nothing that is actually not worth. The idea, the uh, this is the direct contradiction with the philosophy of scarcity, which considers everything as a resource and that too limited in nature, which all earlier generations have been nursing over the past century, which has already gone through two major world wars. Probably the world wars had something to do, but we were more, I mean, we had to store, we have to save. They are not saving oriented. No, they live in the present, as I said. Whatever comes today has to be spent today, like like primitives, like Adivasis. You know, once I went to the Adivasi Pada to meet these people, they're so happy. And they have no savings. When you ask them what you're going to do tomorrow, they said, we'll decide tomorrow. They don't think today for tomorrow. And they're happy with that. So the new generation is. The idea of scarcity does not touch the existence of new generation. This, of course, may open up the idea of economics of abundance, the sign of which has already started being seen in the Western countries. If you look at the economy, the economy is based on basically the idea of scarcity. Everything is scarce. The resources are scarce. They don't believe in that. So the economics has also to be rewritten as an economics of abundance, as if everything is abundant. Everything is. They say the same thing. I mean, they believe in the same philosophy. The water is there. You don't know how to use it. No, they have such a confidence. God has given us seventy percent ocean. We can translate that into drinkable water. Why not? So they are more technology oriented. They are more uh, solution oriented than the problem. We were more problem oriented. They're system busters and no hierarchy. Do not believe in hierarchy. The world has started labeling them as a system busters. They don't like a hierarchy. As I said, they don't like to have a boss. They don't want to work. We already transformed ourselves from the babies of disorder to the habitants of orderly society. In the process, we ourselves curtailed our freedom to live within limits. That's what I said earlier. Just to look around and one can see a method in madness from annihilation of Syria to a massive wave of turbulence in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and so on. The organized violent attacks in different parts of Europe, which never experienced these kinds of terrorist attacks from the time immemorial also speak a lot. If you look at the world scenario today, even the smallest of the things have led into the big things. Black Lives Matter. How big the particular Andolan became. So somewhere small issue and to flare them for the political reasons is very easy with this new generation. And that is going to be a huge challenge in front of the society. They make an issue out of nothing. You know, that is something which uh, we'll have to be careful about. Breaking the hierarchies, the recent episodes in JNU in Delhi, NIT in Kashmir, or Shani in Napur, Maharashtra, are only some of the examples to reinforce the trait. The most challenging situation in the corporate world, which solely works on the structured organization concept, which has already started shaking. They don't believe in structure of organization. We had the organization, the uh, top layer and the lower layer, and somebody reports to somebody. Our institutions were developed like that. Institutions like military organizations, police departments, and even government organizations, we only work on hierarchy. How do we remodel them? We'll have to remodel. You know, we, we had a particular hierarchy. We had a particular structure. Now, here on the other side, we have given the uh, hierarchy of human life. You know How we move from physiological to safety to love belonging, Maslow's hierarchy kind of thing esteem and self-actualization. And I'm going to talk something very interesting about this, which will uh, make you very uh, enlightened on that. You know, Lower biological immunity, slow much, uh, show much lower biological immunity as compared to the earlier generations, and making many drugs of the past decade ineffective. In fact, you know, I think many of us have missed World Health Organization in February 2016, came with a report in deeply concerned as not many established antibiotics are effective. They have identified 10 drugs which don't work on this new generation. Because you know how the drugs are designed basically? Based on human immunity. And the immunity structure, immunity spectrum has changed for the new generation. And the drugs potencies are already at the apex point, so they cannot change anything further. If the immunity fall, the innate power of getting healed would not respond. That may lead to a large population of youth which may not offer healthy proposition for the nation. Unfortunately, they're not health conscious. If you look at the world around, at the age of 30 and 32, if one starts getting the heart attacks and the blood pressure and her diabetes, you know, I think somewhere you need to. We need a healthy, young, 
generation. Only young generation, which is not healthy, would be a liability to the nation. So somewhere we need to appreciate this point also. Intellect at the cost of emotion. This generation is born with a high level of intellect, but at the cost of low levels of consciousness and the faculties of mind and emotions. You know, that's what I said repeatedly. They report extremely low levels of emotion, though they are extremely sensitive when it comes to correcting them. They do not feel sad when you try to correct them, but get offended to a great extent. In fact, there are enough reports to substantiate that. In fact, you know, I just uh, came to know in Ahmedabad it happened just recently. Uh, there's a lady, and uh, she is very well placed in government agencies. Her husband was working in, uh, he is working in a bank, bank office. They have a son, they had. 13 years old son. And the boy is very intellectual. In fact, you know, he was so intellectual, he sat with his parents because he saw his father is overworking, he's coming into a lot of anxieties about finance. So he gave him a financial model just a couple of days before this event happened. And he said, you don't have to work, you can retire and you will be perfectly happy. And that boy, two days later, was actually playing on a mobile. He had an exam next day. Okay. And the mother just told him, just told him, why are you playing with the mobile? Why don't you prepare for the exams tomorrow? That's the, all she said, she said. Okay. The boy went in the inside room, found out a rope somewhere, hang, hung himself to the fan and died. He committed suicide. And she didn't know what hit her. Can you imagine what kind of reaction these children had? She said, I never could realize my own son committing a suicide this way. There was no indication. There were no symptoms. There were no traits at all. Where did they come from? How, how did he react? You know, so somewhere one has to appreciate that the emotions are very difficult for them to control. And that was a very simple statement. I'm going to work, go and work on your studies. Tomorrow is your exam. I mean, I, I, we have been told n number of times. And every time we had committed a suicide, probably it would have been 20 times. You know? So that is, that is something which is... Uh, the children ready to say, I know, to close the communication. In transaction analysis, parlance, one can say that they have closed their adopted child, which is so important to process of learning. They say, I know. Because there's something which you teach children through adopted uh, aspect of uh, psychology. You know, they have the adoption, and that adoption is closed. Now, there are two kinds of teaching, adopted and natural. Child has two kinds of personalities. Adopted child, adopted personality, and the natural personality, natural traits he came with. And not generally, all these years, he used to learn from two things, observations and by studies, by teaching. Now, that teaching part, they have closed. And that is a big, big challenge for the real teacher. Because he doesn't take consciously, he doesn't take adapted things. So, somewhere, we will have to find out the new techniques of teaching in times to come. Now, we come to the crux. They are pratyaharis. They use only once sense at a time. Probably, you can tell me from your own experiences, if your child or your sister, whoever it is, if playing on the mobile or studying on the mobile or tablet, if you call them once, do they respond? If you call them twice, do they respond? If you call them thrice, do they respond? See, most of the parents tell us that nine, ten times you call them, they will still not respond. And that is a big issue of conflict in every home. Now, because you feel he or she is disrespecting you, but honestly, I tell you, they just can't listen when they are watching. That's a fact we have found out after a lot of experiments. When they watch, they watch. They can't listen. When they listen, they listen. They can't walk. In fact, there are n number of accidents which have been documented now. And the most beautiful experience, uh, for, I say beautiful because the lady was saved. The girl was saved. Otherwise, it would have hazard us. There's a, already there's a movie, there's a video on YouTube. In Mumbai, it happened. A girl was walking, 19 years old girl, walking with the, uh, what do you call, ear phones in her ears. And she was walking across the track. And the whole crowd on the other platforms, you know, saw her and saw her good trains coming towards her. They shouted. They shouted. They wanted her to be on off the way. But she didn't. And she saw the train only after about it reached one foot distance. Fortunately, the train ran over her, but she was survived. Not a single injury she had, fortunately. But then there's a lot of study on this particular phenomenon. And she said that, yeah, I didn't see it. She was listening to something. I didn't see it. 
they actually don't listen to you when they're like looking at something because they use only one of the five senses and this is very interesting believe me this is something which is a very highly elevated on the path of spiritual now which is called pratyahara you know the ashtanga path of uh, our friend patanjali sesh patanjali that's a very famous that's a, that's a spine of the whole spiritual processes right he says yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara and then dharana dhyana and samadhi the way you have our own curriculum of engineering and medicine you know step by step you go to the apex point and the apex point is samadhi but you have got to go step by step we had to go from yama niyama asana pranayama and then pratyahar pratyahar means using only one sense and multiple objects only one sense you cannot use the second sense which is highly elevated and they have already achieved it right from the birth and we are not aware and they are not aware they are the siddhas at your home <laughs> that's a problem you know they, they say that earlier the avatars used to take a place krishna was an avatar rama was an avatar parshuram was an avatar buddha was an avatar but only one avatar at a time today every home there's a krishna <laughs> every home has a rama problem is where is yashoda the parent has to be yashoda and nanda baba you know <laughs> you cannot manage a krishna if you don't have the energies of yashoda yashoda mata ki zarurat hai tumhe you have to elevate yourself he cannot elevate he is already elevated he is already pratyahari he is only one sensory organ at a time has lot led to a lot many accidents and crime against these children though they are extremely conscious about their self they show no consciousness towards the surrounding environment this has led to many issues of security and safety philosophies issues industry there's a problem during the safety week you know i used to give give lot of lectures to industries and then i realized see, you can give them the helmets you can give them the gloves but they don't wear it every day you have to remind them you know they don't follow it as a system because they can't think about safety if you can't think about tomorrow you will never think about safety safety issues are always about tomorrow not about today if you can't think of repercussions you can't think of even safety and this insecurity kind of things are you getting this point somewhere they don't know what repercussions are all about that is what one has to appreciate and appreciate that they are the pratyaharis and uh, there are a lot of issues which have been raised today about this particular thing and uh, education a vital force the basic thought behind education is that every child is a soul in evolution and the purpose of education is nothing but to organize personality to reflect the virtues of soul is the purpose getting served in today's education system that is something which we need to appreciate and understand the famous saying of william butler reads on education can be quoted here education is not filling the bucket it is lighting the fire it should kindle the fire from within it should it should lead to lot of questions not answers unfortunately the today's uh, education system is expecting answers from the student while actually it should be keeping them alert to have the questions in fact and there's a, another method of education somebody has found out his name is dr shaddalu ranade he is a educationist of a very high order he says normally what we used to do is the teachers will ask us questions we have to write answers and they will get evaluated and they get the marks this is ask them to write the questions once they read something which is even tougher than writing the answers if you are asked to because you know to ask questions you need to understand the subject not to answer answers can be mugged up questions cannot be mugged up are you getting this point give them a pressy give them a paragraph and ask them to ask questions no let them be question mongers and let them think let them ponder about the life because only when they get the questions they will try to find answers today i think we are trying to make it something which is very easy and not interesting for them industrial outlook towards education may need to be relooked at education does not mean necessarily to make students knowledgeable but to see that they contribute to the enrichment of human life experience in a larger way what is this my student going to uh, offer to the world that is important the industrial model of life has started treating students as a part of the industrial process called education like share raw material that possibly has given rise to an education system which standardizes the parameters of the process of learning in the process we are forgetting that we are missing a vital point that each student has his or her own uniqueness the spontaneity of learning is lost we are thinking that he is a thing he is not a thing he is a being 
He's not a resource, he's a source. So you first drop calling him resource, human resource. Many a times in many of the companies I take this stand, please don't call it HR department. Because the moment you call human as a resource, you are limiting this ability. Main, machine, materials, money. These forums are normally called as resources. Please remove main from there. Machines are resources because resources means always limitedness. Money is limited. Money is a resource. Machines are resource. Materials are resource. What is not resource of the human? He has that infinite power of thought. His ideas are actually what he is made or she is made up of. So somewhere I think we need to really look at to these young children as a source more than resource. The inner process of learning, normally we talk to the children and many of you will find it interesting. If the chitta is impure or blocked, it may lead to, to non-performance no matter what physical efforts one puts through. The input for knowledge passes through these three components to appear as outward expression. This then can be called as knowledge. Now, basically, a lot of people ask me this question. And, and there's again there, there's a difference between the earlier generation and this generation. What is the whole idea of spirituality in studies? That is something. Why should somebody waste a time in meditating when he has an exam next day? No, because somewhere people feel his meditative practices are expenses. It is not expensive, it's an investment. Because if you understand the process of learning thoroughly, it comprises of six steps. The first is listening or writing or looking at. Okay. For example, you're all sitting in a class, listening to me, looking at something which is written. That is the first step of learning. That's what the children do. That's what the students do. That is where they use the physical body, the ears, the eyes, and maybe the hands when they make a note. But is it, is it, is it learning? Does the learning stop there? No, it's the first step. The second step is whatever you have read, whatever you have listened, whatever you have uh, written has to be stored. It's just like eating, you know, it's like a food, digestion. It has to be stored first. Without storage, you cannot go to the next stage. The third stage is assimilation. Whatever you have listened, whatever you have stored has to be understood. If you don't understand what you're stored, I think you're wasting your time. The fourth stage is assimilation, digesting that. You now, as Patanjali would call it, when you eat a bread, it should become a bl blood. If it doesn't become a blood in three hours, you have a problem. Whatever you eat has to go into the stream of blood so that your vitality is maintained. If the bread remains as a bread in your body and doesn't become a blood, I think you are in from serious indigestion problems. Same thing happening in education today. No, the fourth stage is not taken seriously. We need to assimilate. It has to become a knowledge. It is no longer an information. The fifth stage is retrieval. Because we have the evaluation system, you've got to write an examination. And when you sit to write examination or give viva, you need to remember what you've studied and stored and understood and assimilated. If it doesn't happen, the travel doesn't happen, you're a failure. And the last one is expressing yourself, either through writing or through speaking or whatever way. Are you getting this? If you look at these six steps of learning, the first and the sixth is actually physical. There are only where two steps where you use your physical body, eyes, hands, ears, etc., or mouth. All four steps in between, storing, understanding, assimilating, and retrieving are happening beyond body, within your mind and intellect and emotions, which is called chitta. No, chitta is that concept. It is something which is actually giving you the, your own performance, not the writing, not the listening. Are you getting me? You can only express what you have understood. If you're not understood and if it's not become a part of your existence, that's what they say about Swami Vivekananda. You would read once, and he can recite everything verbatim. Because his chitta was so pure, whatever went in came out 100%. He didn't have to make efforts. That's effortless learning. And these children, coming back to that, their intellect is extremely high. But unfortunately, it is not their intellect which is examined. It is a mind which is examined. Mind has to express. If you don't express, 
In fact, the major complaint that has come to us from the education systems all over is that children cannot write in three hours. They cannot complete the papers. They cannot express fully, even if they know. And that is something which is frustrating from the child because he knows everything. In Surat case that happened, there's 45 children who committed suicide were actually brilliant people. They're not the dull people. They're not duffers. See, duffers don't get frustrated. The intelligent people get frustrated when the intelligent is not recognized. They knew everything, but they could not write everything. And what you examined is what they wrote, not what they know. Am I getting it right? And when you say that you know everything and you have got only 50% marks and not 80 or 85% or 90%, which your knowledge actually expected, then you are frustrated with the system. Then you know you cannot fit in the system. And that is where all this kind of violence begins. Somewhere we need to really appreciate what they know, not what they express. They're extremely slow in writing because writing requires a mind and they don't have a good mind. Today's challenge is that they have extremely good intelligence, but unfortunately they have weak minds and it is a mind which expresses the intelligence. Intelligence cannot express itself. Am I getting it correct? For young people, I think I'm telling you, you know everything, but you cannot express everything that you know. You know, the, the, the intellect creates ideas. If you look at the whole idea of studies, the whole, whole philosophy of studies, See, how do we how do we write? How do we know? How do we live actually? If you look at the whole process of life, the science of consciousness, I'm talking to you right now. Where is it coming from? Look at the process beyond. Don't look at the words. Don't listen to words alone. There's something happening inside which is not visible to you and visible to me either. Are you getting this? The waves of consciousness are spreading all over all the time, 24 by 7, over you and over me. And the moment our intellect connects to the wave of consciousness, the idea is generated. Idea is produced. The brilliant people produce brilliant ideas. And the idea which is generated has to come to the mind to convert into a thought. If the idea doesn't become a thought, it's wasted. The moment it becomes a thought, even the process is not complete. It has to meet the heart to create passion, emotion. If I don't feel like talking certain things, I cannot talk it. It has to have the passionate drive behind it. And when it comes and when it touches your passion, touches your body, you express it. So before expression, there are three stages. Generation of ideas, generation of thoughts, and generation of emotions or passion. If these three do not follow in sync, you will never be able to express. You will never be able to do that action. Unfortunately, in these children, they create a lot of ideas. But the mind is weak enough to catch all the ideas. Can you, can you imagine the machine, you know, industrial process? There's a machine one produces ideas, which become a raw material for the machine two, which is called mind to produce the thoughts. The thought is the end product for the second machine, but become the ingredient for the machine three called heart to create an emotion. And there's a parallel machine again in series here, which is body, which will create a karma, which will create action, which will create the activity. So it depends on the purity of these three processes so that whatever you come out with, whatever you express with, whatever you are active with becomes pure. Unfortunately, just imagine they have creating too many ideas, but the mind is not well developed to process it further to thought. So most of the ideas go into backlash. It's like a getting jammed into a traffic. Have you ever experienced traffic jam? Two hours, three hours, you are jammed. You cannot move. You cannot move to the right, to the left, to the front. And what do you feel? You feel like killing everybody. You feel like crashing all the cars around, don't you? Even at this adult age, even at the mature age. Because that's a stress. That's a stressor. These children are going through that stress every moment. They cannot translate their ideas to mind. No, I'm sorry to say that, but the mind is weak. Emotion, the intellect is very strong. You cannot have everything strong because the God has given you 100 units of consciousness to be distributed over this. Some people are intelligent because they have larger consciousness quotient to the intellect. Some people are extremely emotional at the cost of their intellect. They may not be very logical, but they are like a poet. They can see a, a full moon in the sun. 
Are you getting these points? So some way they are more poetic by nature. That's what we say. The spell of person is poet oriented. A manager has to be mind oriented. He cannot be very intelligent. He cannot be very poetic. He has to deliver the research at the mind level. Are you getting this? The word man has come from the word man, man, manasa. The word man, the man, human, the man, the woman, everything is a derivative. The manusha, the manava, derivative of mind. Because mind is the core point of the human. If there is no mind, there is no human. Unfortunately, these children give that impression that they are not humans. If the mind is weak. And I give you one uh, uh, feeler. When you, I have been trying this with this young generation. You make them stand here and ask them what could be the area of this room, approximately. And I'm sure that they will not be able to tell you. And we would. Our generation could. I'll, I'll just look at that. Maybe I'll see it's about 30 feet or 40 feet this way. Maybe about 40 feet this way, 1,600 square foot on an average. They can tell you right from 50 feet to 5,000 feet. Not for it, nothing, but they don't have the dimensions of space and time, which are actually a perception of mind. If there's no good mind, there's no good perception of time. And that's why they cannot write in three hours. In spite of having mobiles and the, uh, I mean, the clocks in the room, in our younger times, there were, in our school, there were hardly a clock in the class. Maybe a one out of four classes had because the schools could not afford. We did not have this kind of raised watches that time. I think the first one came in 1964 with HMT. <laughs> that was the first company came with an affordable watch. Are you getting this? So we had no watch. But I don't think that our generation ever missed. Of course, a lot of people did not write because they didn't know. But hardly anybody could not write because there was a time was not sufficient. Three hours was good enough. For them, three hours is not. They can't write because the writing process, they're very weak. Because writing means using mind. Probably, I think you can take Viva and they should be better. So education system has to change the evaluation method. Somewhere we need to appreciate that everybody has a different way of expression. Give them enough chance so that they can stand in competition. Are we getting this? So somewhere I think we need to really appreciate that aspect. Innocence with wisdom. Innocence is how the soul expresses itself. That is the face of the soul. It needs to be kept intact if one wants to make the curiosity and hero worship to most important tools of true teaching, as we'll, we'll see soon. The child is also born with ignorance, ignorance with respect to the mundane life experiences that needs to be worked upon by the education and translated into wisdom for the world that we all live in. And we need to realize that while removing the ignorance of a child, we should maintain that innocence is intact. It is a big challenge for a teaching community. Only a surgical precision of an eye doctor can skillfully remove the cataract from the eye for a better vision. Removing the whole eye leads to blindness. Today we see that a kind of blinded intelligence. They are born, I think we are all born with innocence and ignorance. Ignorance about this world. We have a wisdom of life, but that is not useful for the material life that we have. Uh, we have already chosen. So some way that ignorance has to be removed. Don't remove the innocence. Unfortunately, today we are trying to make the children smart. Don't make them smart, make them wise. That will not serve the nation. That will not serve the society. We can have the smart cities, we can have the smart phones, but we cannot have the smart child. Because the moment you talk smart, you talk of competition, you talk of beating others, you talk, talk of the smartness itself as the violence built in. Let them not be smart, let them be wise. It is the wisdom which helps the life, not the smartness. Are you getting the smartness is one upmanship on the other. So somewhere I think we need to, with the precision of a surgical doctor, we should need only the cataract, not die. It's a very skillful project, and for a teacher one has to do, and somewhere I said right in the beginning of this particular slide, that the two most important tools are curiosity and hero worship. That is how we were brought, that is how we got educated. Now these are the two beautiful tools of learning again. No, you need to be curious about it. Today, unfortunately, the curiosity is dead. Because everybody feels, go to the Google and see. Google gives you information again. It will not satisfy your curiosity. Curiosity has a creativity. How does it happen? The whole world knows the law of gravitation. The whole world knows. Because we have been taught about it time and again. How the fruit falls. But hardly any child knows how the tree grows. What is that force against gravitation? 
And it always enchanted me as a child. How a small blade of grass break through that gravitation force of the Earth, which cannot make that moon so far move from his orbit. The gravitation force of the Earth is so strong that it works on the moon, but it doesn't work on the place of crack, glass of bread. I mean, who, who, what that force is? Teach them that. I think we have taught them enough about the falling fruit. We have not taught them enough about the growing tree. So may let them be curious about it. And then let there be idol worship. We had idols in our childhood. Today, unfortunately, under the name of realities, we have made all idols fall to the earth. Give them the hope. Give them, try to make them become something. You should always have some kind of target to become. You should always have to an idol in front of you. Unfortunately, today there are no idols. Are you getting this point? So I think this is too something which uh, education system has to provide to them. Knowledge filled child and wise child, as I, as I said before, the appropriateness of knowledge is a key factor. Only knowledge may not happen. Uchitta, auchitya. Appropriateness of the knowledge is very, very important. One has to remember that one does not become stronger and healthier by eating more, but one can become stronger and healthier by digesting more. The same is true with the knowledge. If it does, you don't digest your knowledge, it's not good for you. The question is, while giving the unlimited knowledge, how and where we are going to create the digestion power? In fact, in the University of uh, Illinois, I was giving a lecture and I made a statement that the time has come for the education system to stop these mobiles and internet. And one professor, American professor, very senior, maybe 55, 60 plus, as it is there very red, he became red with anger. And he shouted at me. He said, you are talking of breach of freedom. I said, did I talk about breach of freedom? He says, yes. You are saying stop the internet, stop the Google. I said, yes, because they are not good for the learning. Then I asked him, do you really value your freedom? He says, yes. Then I asked him, why do you drive your cars at 60 miles and 70 miles and not 100 miles when your cars are perfectly capable of driving? Why do you to follow the rules? Why do you have to drive on the left side of the road and not in the middle? Don't you think it's a breach of your freedom? It's my car. I can drive anywhere. I can drive wherever I want, in whatever direction. How can the government decide? Why does your car stop at the red light? Does you don't you think it's a breach of your freedom? He says, no, if I don't do that, we'll meet accidents. And I have to tell him, you are talking of physical accidents. I'm talking of emotional accidents. Unfortunate. And then he said, oh, I know what you're saying. That's the point. That's the point. Somewhere I've got, we have got to know how much inputs you're going to give on these children. We had a very limited inputs books, which we could choose. It didn't come from all over. Today, the young children, the young students have so much inputs coming, so many inputs to them from so many directions. No? And we think that we are going to make them wise and smart by doing this. We are not. If you love your child, how many times in a day you should feed the child? How many meals you should give? Eight, nine, ten, or two? Hmm? Do you believe that by eating more, your child becomes stronger? or digesting more. The more the inputs means more the eating. But if you eat something without having the digestive power, you are actually spoiling the health of your child. Don't make him eat 10 times or 8 times or 7 times or even 4 times. Give him two meals, but nutritious meals. Don't give too many inputs on information. Unfortunately, today children, they're lost. They've lost the whole power of discretion. What is to be chosen? What is not to be chosen? Are you getting this point? Unfortunately, I'm seeing that the reading habits have gone down. And more so I'm finding in the state of Gujarat, because we have been working with students here and we are trying to cultivate that habit. They hardly read. So when you read something, you have to read between the lines also. We have to visualize. Are you getting this point? There's no visualization when we are reading, when we are reading on the internet. No visualization. One after the other, you are seeing the videos. You have no time to visualize. You have no time to understand what you have read. Are you getting this point? So somewhere see that your inputs are restricted. That's not a breach of freedom. You still have a freedom. 
the question is what do you mean by freedom hmm? so education system has to have the appropriate freedom for the child the direction and the purpose of the destination of knowledge are the two most important issues if scientific education is to enrich humanity the direction is important the purpose is important higher knowledge should lead to higher levels of happiness and peace it should make life more beautiful and rich education system based on the morality and ethics can make that possible today we find that the commercialization of education has taken us very far from the ideas of mortality morality and ethics cultured and educated were synonymous earlier that is lost pehle zamane mein we see i mean somebody is you don't have to say that he is cultured and he is educated means is cultured education had already imbibed the culture within you didn't have to say if that person is educated is not going to speed on the road today you cannot say that he may have four degrees four post graduations but he will speed in the road because the culture has already diverse the education educated and cultured has already diverse the two different personalities somewhere we need to have that one the direction is very important the kauravas and pandavas had the same university university of dronacharya same you same guru same master but kauravas were dangerous to the world pandavas were good to the world ek uchitta ek anuchitta same same knowledge it is like a weapon weapon is neither good or bad do you think ak47 is good or bad hmm? ak56 is good or bad missile launcher is good or bad weapons are nirguna they have no properties of their own it is the hands behind and the minds behind which make it good or bad one has to see that the qualification of the child and we hardly give any time for improving purifying the chitta which is actually a driving force behind his performance it doesn't matter whether he has become an engineer the what matters is what is going to contribute to the society otherwise his engineering knowledge is actually not adding any value addition to the social wealth are we getting this point how my student is going to stand and what is he going to contribute the teacher should be happy and proud about that are we getting this point it's not about what how many marks he got what grade he got yes that might have opened some new opportunities for him somewhere i think we need to really see the direction and the purpose of the destination as you can see teachers students and parents are three major angles of education angle there's a triangle one needs to introspect with the teachers today carry the same kind of dedication and commitment to the profession are the parents carry the same kind of compassion and love for their children and willing to work to create a future for their wards are they both willing to be partners in progress of the child if teachers do not become ideal teachers and the parents fail to be ideal parents how can a student be an ideal student today two angles the triangle have fallen apart the triangle of the education has come into serious problem of survival are you getting this point somewhere it's a triangle of education the parents and teachers have equal contribution into the child's growth today unfortunately i would say the parents are no longer responsible parents and the teachers are no longer the teachers what they were some way that compassion some that personal touch is lost let me share here a small experience of my life when i was in fourth standard i lost my mother it was very early age for one to lose mother you know very emotional and i had exams immediately two months later and i still remember my class teacher made me sit in her lap and made me write the papers all my papers i wrote sitting in the lap of my teacher she used to have her hand on my back and she said don't worry write she had the tears in her eyes because she knew what emotional condition i was going through my question is how many teachers are like there today how many teachers really know what is happening to the student at his emotional level i stood first in that exam and the entire credit goes to my teacher if she had not done what she had done i would not have been here that's a contribution of teacher in the life not in the degree she made me a wonderful person because she herself was a wonderful person i'm still looking out for her it ages now almost 50 60 years have passed are you getting this point what is that emotion where is that passion no as a human being see ultimately we are teachers but we are humans the student is a student still is human that human teacher in life is somewhere getting lost 
while growing in our facilities and infrastructure for higher studies, one also needs to ensure that there are enough opportunities created to utilize the large number of professionals and put them in economic stream of the nation. Otherwise, we are bound to create a huge level of frustration in the young minds, which started with a dream in heart, a dream of prosperity and recognition, a dream of status and enriched lifestyles based on the foundation of higher education promises. You can make engineers, but also see that there are enough jobs for them. Otherwise, very frustrating. I have become an engineer and I don't have an opportunity is a very bad proposition. It was better that I was not made engineer. Are you getting this point? The younger citizens then may also be looking out for greener pastures in countries abroad. This may lead to a situation where India could still be a generator of largest youth force, the potency of which is used by other countries for their prosperities and powers. India would once again be left high and dry. Let us not as a nation be only a school to teach and somebody else and which is the uh, benefits of that. So somewhere I think the country also has to see, the education institution also has to see that there's enough provisions for them as a career opportunities. We need teachers who can tell the students why to live in this world rather than how to live. I think we are all trying to teach them how to live. The question is why? Somewhere I think we need to have that question addressed. We need teachers with an understanding that is human heart which needs to be touched for a real transformation in human life. See, ultimately, education leads to transformation, or should. If it doesn't lead to transformation, I think our efforts are wasted. And the transformation can only happen when you touch somebody's heart. You may teach the intellect of the student, reach his or her mind, but ultimately touching the heart may make the entire process more meaningful. But then to touch somebody's heart, one needs to be in the heart. You cannot approach from intellect and transform somebody. Intellect has no ability to transform. Mind has no ability to transform. Mind can teach a mind. Mind can reach a mind. Intellect can teach an intellect. But heart can transform. Only the teachers with dedication at heart can rise up to this challenge. Youth is a massive power, much stronger than any sources of power that mankind ever knows. Only if we can channelize and give direction to the massive force of youth, in times to come, India as a nation can proudly take strides toward the leadership of the world. And this is the triangle of education, if I was talking about, which everybody involved in this triangle has to think about. Thank you and Jai Hind. Now, I'll spare the balance time in answering the questions, if at all somebody has. With the permission of uh, the president, I think. I'm willing to answer any questions to the best of my abilities based on my research. Because this is one subject you know, which is very, very important and burning today. And if you di just discharge and disconnect ourselves from this, probably I think uh, we'll have a tougher times in future. Yeah. So any PM from any of your audience people, anyone would like to know, because you, know, you cannot pack up everything in one and a half, two hours presentation. So, please be free to ask. I don't want any kind of a bias. I told you right now, we are here searching for the realities, any not questions? passing judgment. Students, even the teachers. Yes, yes ma'am. Just a second. Sir, you are a Reiki healer, right? So actually, I wanted to know like how you got into it and how was the journey? Like I wanted to know about the journey. Journey like, from learning, where to where? Learning it and you know experiencing the power from within of that hands healing. Yeah, thank you for this question, man. Thank you. See, basically, if you look at the journey, you have to start from somewhere and end somewhere. My journey never ended. My ne journey never started because I never considered. Reiki is a uh, different phenomenon or different entity. So Reiki is a spiritual practice and spirit is what we are. Right from the childhood, I had a tremendous respect for goodness. I always thought the goodness should be prevailing over all the evil things. That was an attitude I was born with. Thanks to my parents, thanks to the divine which gave me a birth. 
So Reiki healing was much easier because you know, it's something natural, something that we are all healers. It's not only me. Unfortunately, we do not know that the healers. So Reiki science actually makes you aware that you are the healers. It just wakes you up from what you have within you. It doesn't bring anything from outside. As human beings, as a part of the divine, you know, you know something children up to the five and six uh, age, you know, they are the healers. They don't need to do any, any, uh, any kind of process. When they just touch you, if you have the headache, the headache vanishes. But we have not seen into that. That's a problem. We are born healers. No? Because we are pure. I mean, we are the pure, unsh of that divine. No? We are a pure part of the divine. We have come from divine. And we go back to divine. Unfortunately, we cannot stay with divine because of our misgivings, misconceptions, hmm? and the wrong ideas about life. So I, I think it came naturally to me. Earlier now, when I look back, I was a corporate consultant. And now I know it, I was doing corporate healing. Because the corporates are nothing but a co combination or of the people that's coming together. Ten people come together from one organization. Hundred people come together. You know. But when the hundred people are very happy with themselves, the organization becomes very profitable. Are you getting this point? We use the word profit for the organization. We don't use it for the individual. For individual, we call it happy. We cannot call happy organization. It's a profitable organization. So it is, I think, two words with the same kind of a meaning in different context. Are you getting this? So always believed, I did my business, I had a number of people working under me, and I'm very proud to say as a leader, not even one person left me in my career, my life. Nobody left me. I could retain my uh, people, my assistant, they performed very well. I was always proud of my uh, teams. You know, because certain things as a human being, you know, when you approach, first approach them as human. That spirituality is all about. They were not my co-workers, they were not my assistant, they were not my bosses. They were all humans. And once you know how to handle the humans, that is what the Reiki is all about. Are you getting this point? As I said, the mind is something which is to be nurtured. And today we are losing mind. That's why we are ceasing to be humans. And when you cease to be humans, you become animal. No, we have started from animality. We have come into humanity and we have to become divinity. That's a path. Swami Vivekananda used to say that. That's a path. Education has to make you a human from the animal and the divine from the human. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen nowadays. We become human and again we fall into the zone of animality. Are you getting this point? Reiki doesn't allow that happen. That's why Reiki is something which is very close to my heart because of that. Because it is the power of generating the divinity within the human. We are all divine by nature. But somewhere we are ignored ignorant about our own divin divinity. Hmm? While learning other things, we have, we have lost the connection with the nature. No? Healing is very natural. I mean, I've always been telling people, see, I mean, the God has provided the he healing, healthcare system all around you. If you have some severe pain at any point of time, including your toothache, go and hug the nearest tree. Within five minutes, your pains are killed. Pains are gone. We don't do it. That's a problem. We are not using the nature. We are not using the natural power. We have lost the trust in the nature. Hmm? That is a problem. So get back that trust. That is what the Reiki is all about. No, healing is natural. The flow is natural. We don't remain natural. That's a problem. Are you getting this point? That's why I always believe that becoming smart is something which you are separating yourself from the divinity. Becoming wise is. Are you getting this point? When I am wise, I am not threat to anybody. But when I'm smart, probably look, people look to me as a threat, as a perception. No, because then there's an adjective. So st smart, smarter, smartest. There's nothing like wiser and wisest. Wiser, wise. Are you getting this point? No? There are no hierarchies of wisdom. And wisdom, wise people know that. That's why they don't compete. Hmm? Are you getting this point? So thank you. I mean, this is how it happened. It wasn't happening for me. Yeah, actually, a few days ago, I was like, I came to know about Reiki and I was doing a bit of a research on that. It like highly interested me. So today I'm actually very delighted that like there's someone who has been like doing this art, has been knowing this art. So I really wanted to know like how you felt about the whole journey of yeah, learning journey the has art been very again, and tapping into that energy. My journey till now is very pleasant and I'm turning 70 soon. <laughs> Definitely. 
that's a long beautiful journey the life is a beautiful uh, proposition if you keep it beautiful problem is we make it ugly because of our desires a wrong understanding of life it's a celebration life is a celebration you know every moment is a moment of celebration if you know what you are it's normally see we are all complete when we come to this world but we are not aware about it we think we are incomplete we need to complete ourselves you no know? and then we keep on having desires if i get this i'll become complete you don't when you get that i'll become complete you don't when i get something else i become complete you don't because you are already complete you cannot become what you are you can only become what you are not that's what the whole life you know we are trying to find the happiness through activity and reiki the whole process is reward you are happy first and then to activity are you getting this point and that is the crux of the ancient science ancient wisdom when they used to teach i mean like the education they had you know ancient education if you look many of you may be reading the scriptures almost all the scriptures the guru has told the disciple now your studies are over after 12 years in gurukula he has never said a single time that you follow me he will say now you go back to the sansara and do a wonderful family no first empower people to live properly today unfortunately people are living without empowerment are you getting education system has that role to play make a wonderful citizen so he becomes he becomes a wonderful husband she becomes a wonderful wife so if you are a wonderful human then you whatever you become you become wonderful then you are a wonderful doctor you are a wonderful architect you know wonderful teacher because basically you are a wonderful human are you getting this the earlier education system was enticing his inner abilities to make him responsible have you ever seen madam that responsibility word you know a lot of people when i ask people like i think you said about reiki i ask people why don't you come on this path and they said no no we have no time as what do you mean they said we are responsible i said for what responsible for my job responsible for my uh, wife responsible for my children responsible for my parents i said have you understood the word responsibility the word responsibility actually came from ability to respond where is the ability today unfortunately many of us are thinking we are responsible without ability holding yourself responsible without the backup of ability is a disaster it's a stressor and today the stress is being created mainly because of that reason we are doing something which we are not capable of and i get that so first become capable education should make you capable to run your life are you getting this point education is such a strong uh, force to make you a wonderful human those are formative years no in fact uh, i'm coming out with an idea i wrote to some schools so now the science also knows that whatever happens in your first 8 years of life actually it becomes a script for your entire life entire life first 6 to 8 years or 10 years let us say all over the world we scientists have been accepting this fact and during that the maximum influence is coming from the parents and the teachers they are responsible for creating a good citizen no whatever you imbibe in my my uh, idea that i have been coming out with i have seen many failures in the marriages today i have seen many failure in employment today no because 5 minutes 10 minutes process of selecting a person you no know, as a husband or a wife or even employer employee you know all these things you cannot understand people in 5 10 minutes the schools and the university should have this special service offered to the society they can make a profile of the child right from the age of 4 or 5 whenever he entered till about 10 years and that profile is actually his kundali for the entire life that sets the traits if somebody wants to marry somebody and he goes to the school and says can i have this data what is the basic trait of this person and if we get the person with the right traits one will never have a divorce in life are you getting this there are no no inputs to select the relationship and relationship doesn't mean husband wife alone it could be employer employee relationship too if you know the traits the, the childhood traits of your employer that itself will make employee fit in the right slot 
we are just seeing superficially what has he learned what qualifications he has what grade he has got which university he belonged to don't go by that that's very peripheral and that's not going to when when he faces the different situations in the workforce workplace he is not going to use that peripheral he is going to use his basic attitudes it is the attitude which you are employing it is the approach which you are employing it is the ability which you are employing these three a's are very important for somebody to select a relationship and unfortunately we are not looking at this three am i getting this the entire program is written in the childhood the education system has to use this to guide the society are you getting this point the girl who is brought with certain concepts in this formative years invariably is going to use it in the family as she goes or whichever working place she goes we are not different the humans are same only situations change but human attitude reactions will happen the same way are you getting this point so somewhere let us look at the human core a, a major center point of everything you know even in the education institutes if you look at i feel sad sometimes till about 60s 70s you know the student was the focus of the education system somewhere around 70s it started moving to the teachers you know student was sidelined but still teacher was in the focus last 20 years it is not even a teacher it is the education system and the facilities you provide has become the major focus look at any advertisements of any school any university any college they will talk of everything about air conditioned rooms and personal laptops and this and that facilities they will not talk of teachers nobody says that we have this kind of teachers we have a teacher with 35 years experience nobody says that and that's a sad state today are you getting this so somewhere the focus is already gone from student to teacher to institution today we see how many uh, branches this institution has before admitting our child don't do that it is a teacher who is going to teach it's not about the facilities and infrastructure that he teaches it adds the value that's all no but it adds the style it's a peripheral it will probably make no transformation humans cannot be substituted by the infrastructure you know learning and teaching is very personal phenomenon it's a personal activity and we should respect that thank you for asking this question yeah god bless you anybody else would like to anyone have any? else no teachers yes <laughs> no. Uh, you have given a very thought provoking and wonderful talk thank you you have talked about the i would say the new generation child traits and you call them the common traits right yeah. which are yeah, yeah. i think very different from yeah, the past obviously. they're totally different than the earlier correct now so my question is that what is your suggestion to you know reforms of the university so that the education becomes more meaningful and relevant to what is actually emerging in terms of those traits where the universities can tackle those traits or very rather true. harness around those traits so yeah th thank you very much as i said some of the traits like you know they like to learn with the nature so drop the classrooms they are already bored with the classroom no matter with the air conditioned or otherwise it may have the electronic board it may have everything but they do they can't learn in the classrooms they can't learn in the four walls they have to be taken out there so somewhere i think that gurukula system somewhere but gurukula system is invalid today for the simple reason in fact you know, there are four systems the education system possible one is the ancient gurukula system where the child would go to the gurukula 12 years the formative years will be under the right kind of influence and he comes back as a citizen a proud uh, adult with all kinds of virtues required to have a wonderful decent life you know it is a life enrichment process started in 12 years but that is not valid today for the simple reason earlier people used to have four or five or six children so one of them could go today we have a, some kind of a uh, what you nuclear family where there's only one single child 
and don't think any parent would like to see him off for 12 years and that's not practical the second thing and the other extreme is the school and colleges that we have today with the four walls and i think this model is already breaking out i'm afraid another 5 10 years and probably the school concept may vanish the third option some of people have followed in fact in a small village of devrug where my ashram is surprisingly 60 parents only from one village with a population of 18000 have already withdrawn their children from the school and started what you say uh, school homeschooling homeschooling but they are also finding it tough because a husband and a wife they need to do something else with the earning also the child and they may not have all the empowerment of the teacher they may not know all the subjects and the second thing what happens child gets isolated so he misses that social angle social relationship so that model also may not be workable we are coming out with a model called edu spot which is a combination of gurukula and the uh, homeschooling and we are registering with nios national institute of open schooling where one person one teacher can teach about 15 students you know partly classroom partly uh, nature they will be taken to the ashram and taught and the combination of the blending of these two and so far what we have tried it works i'll give you a simple thing all of us say that the children should not use mobile excessively okay we all know that and we tell the children it's not good but we are not telling what is good what is an alternative we know the huge wave that is created by the uh, social evils you know like uh, mobiles and internets and sometimes it's uh, troublesome but we have not created another wave to beat that wave you cannot wish the wave out the wave will remain you have to create a bigger wave to counter that and we are do- doing exactly that we took some children to our ashram and told him not to use the mobiles for 15 days and surprisingly after 15 days even after coming to the urban cities they don't want to use mobiles no because we wanted to do one experiment are they really in love with mobiles then we got an answer no they are in mo- love with their chip chip silicon chip then we realized that these new children which are normally called as indigo children they have a third eye which is very powerful that's why their intellect is so powerful and they are called indigo children okay they have the affinity for the indigo that frequency the frequency of carbon lord shiva so they have a carbon affinity and the silicon is the cheaper version of carbon and if you take them to the nature nature is full of carbon the trees and the woods and everything is carbon when you take them there the carbon affinity part is totally uh, taken care of and they don't need to settle for silicon there is something revolutionary they don't have to use the silicon chip to enjoy to get related to the mobile tomorrow probably the mobile is removed with silicon chip and sub- substituted with something else they may not be so somewhere let us go to the root cause the root cause is not the mobile the root cause is the silicon chip the root cause is the silicon the root cause is the carbon give them some other carbon version and they are very happy in the woods in the midst of trees and all their all needs are satisfied and they don't use the mobile that and that is something which we have proven so maybe i think this kind of taking into them to the nature they are very close to the nature they are very close to the animals probably i think we need to take them back to that you now from the schools classrooms i think they need to be taken to the nature rooms you know probably that works so maybe i think the institutions can think for these kind of things second thing what i have been repeatedly saying consciously they stop your teaching they don't want to take anything in but subconsciously they are open and subconsciously one can teach them beautifully without any resistance and that's what earlier gurus did none of the gurus actually taught you in the day they used to teach in the midst of the night to your sleeping mind most of the uh, if you look at the newton or the uh, uh, even madame curie even archimedes all this stuff they have not learned in this classroom all these laws somewhere most of them if you see when they were alone in isolation they were empowered so somewhere i think we need to really appreciate the subconscious mind the impact of subconscious mind the importance of subconscious mind in teaching yoganidra for example is a wonderful way of teaching i'll cite you one example it's about a small school in our devrug village the children uh, were in the fifth standard and one of my students became a teacher in that school and she was posted on the fifth standard duty 
And you know that most of the governments, state governments, had the policy a few years ago just to pass children. They never took the examination of the children. The real examination of the teacher, how to pass them. You know, that was a tough challenge. And somewhere they had to do because the government said you have to do it. So she realized that four of the children actually could not read even a single letter. And they were in fifth. So she came to me and told me, how do you teach them? Because they have no idea, they have no introduction to letters, alphabets at all. Then we decided to do an experiment, teaching them is Yoga Nidra. I taught her Yoga Nidra. I took Yoga Nidra along with her for these four children. And you'll be surprised in the first 10 days itself, on the 10th day, all those backbenchers sitting behind, they could not relate to the class, came into the first bench. And they started reading like uh, anything. Now that transformation when people saw, the other schools approached us. Can we do it? It's a miraculous way. So we cannot get bogged down by the conditions. We have got to find out as well as the challenges and opportunities. There's a beautiful opportunity of teaching somebody through subconscious mind. So that subconscious teaching is going to be a, probably a teaching of tomorrow. So maybe I think we'll have to adapt. We'll have to do a lot of search on this and adjust ourselves. First, I think we'll have to learn so that we can teach. Are you getting this? I think most of the time I've seen the teachers have stopped learning. And when the learning stops, the teaching automatically stops. Because teaching is a reverse learning. Yeah. So I think we need to learn all the time. Thank you for this question. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, the no hands further. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for bringing out uh, such uh, traits of new generation. Uh, we were really unaware of. And being a teacher, it's very important to understand this. We need to realign, fine tune. So, sir, would you please recommend uh, good practices for teachers? So I that think there are enough. Probably I will have to one uh, <laughs> session for teachers. Yeah. <laughs> training the teacher. We have the program training for teachers. Yes. Because as I said, I'm not interested in teaching the children now. Because they're already wise. They have reached a particular level. The problem is with us. We are still hanging around yum yum. They are fired of us. So generally, I give one example. You have a dog by any chance? No. You have seen somebody with a dog? Yes. No, they take the dog for a stroll. No, how do, what's the whole process? They have a leash in the hand. They keep them down. And at one particular point they reach, reach a garden or so, they remove the leash so the dog can run. And the dog runs, obviously. That's his tendency. He runs up to a point and then stands and looks back to the master. Okay, now let us see the dog's name is Moti. You call him Moti, what happens? He turns back and comes to you. Okay. Have you ever seen that somebody taking a child for a walk? Four years old child. Must have seen. Now child also is like a dog. I mean, you know, to that, that year. Then you take him for the stroll. You just let him be free because there's no traffic around the garden. And the child runs because it's his tendency also to run. And he exactly shows the same trait. He stands there and looks back. Now, let us say the child's name. What do you want to say? Uh, Nandu, for example. You call Nandu. And Nandu, what is that does? He doesn't come back. He goes further. See, so it is more dangerous because he will cross the road. He will get smashed by the uh, car. and There will be an accident. So what one has to do is don't call him. First run ahead of him. And from the other side, you call him. Then it is safe proposition. Same thing is happening with you. If you really want to control a child, be ahead of child. If you want to control a dog, be behind a dog. Are you getting this point? So I think every parent has to empower oneself, have the energy levels high. Every teacher may have to do that either because teacher is a parent, I personally believe. And the parent is a teacher. Both have the alternate roles to play. One in school, one in home. So they have to rise above. They have to go in front of the child and control him from the front. Child, human child cannot be controlled from behind. Are we getting this point? So I think we all need to buck up our energies. Make ourselves. If they are pratyaharis, we have got to reach somewhere around dharana. So we can control. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is that all? Any more questions? I was expecting a lot of questions to come from you. Yes. 
Because you know, when you ask the question, I know you are alive. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, earlier in your PPT, you had mentioned about that the youngsters today have anxiety problems. Yes. So what would you recommend that they should do to overcome that? That we don't have suddenly, suddenly we feel confident, yeah. but suddenly with the next moment, we feel like, uh, I hope you understand. No, no, you have a lot of mood swings. You know? Basically, because and if you look at that, and that also was a revelation to us. When we brought some students to our shibirs in uh, ashram, and we tried to teach them pranayama, we realized that 70% of the children that we had there are not breathing properly. There's something seriously wrong in the breathing right from the birth. The breathing system is hevai. They're not rhythming breathing. And that's why I see, you know, breath is a carrier of emotions. Breath is a carrier of moods. So when you're not breathing properly, you cannot have stable emotions. Are you getting this? So pranayam comes before pratyahara. Their pranayam is not done. So what normally we do, we teach them pranayama. The young students should do pranayama regularly, control their breath, so their emotions are controlled. And when the emotions are controlled, the life is controlled. Because life is nothing but emotions. Are you getting? That is the easiest way one can approach. And I believe that most of the education institutes should work on their breathing so that they have a stable emotions. And when the emotions are stable, generally the whole uh, life profile becomes stable. They don't have too many disruptions. No? So somebody, that is a crux. And you see, I mean, I, most of you see, if you, could do, uh, if you look at your own uh, nostrils, normally it should be every 15 minutes, it should be alternate. It doesn't happen. You keep on breathing on the right nostril more, so you have that hyper nature. It increases the temperature by 2 degrees Fahrenheit in your brain all the time. And with that, you know, you're also subjected to a lot of immunity problems. So somewhere you need to have a balanced breathing. So I would prefer breathing process to be handled. And as uh, that wonderful lady asked about uh, Reiki, and Reiki does it. We have found out in Reiki, your rhythmic breathing sets in. And then the whole breathing, thought process, ideation, they are all aligned. So it gives a lot of balance to the personalities. So we have taught n number of children in the younger zone, say 20 plus, and it has benefited them tremendously. They are a very balanced person. And when you are balanced, whatever you do, you become a balanced engineer, balanced manager. Some way that balance is lost. Some way that needs to be nurtured. Education apart. I think one has to understand ourselves, balance ourselves, and whatever education we have about ourselves, that is very important. Are you getting this point? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. See, if you don't know what you are, you cannot become what you want to. No. First, understand what you are, then you can have any kind of ambitions. The problem is ambitions without abilities is a disaster. Today's children are more desire-oriented, that's why they have tremendous ambitions, but they are not backed up by their abilities. So we have come out with a specific model called uh, matrix of uh, ability and ambition uh, index. You know, M-A-A-I, my. You know, that index tells you whether you are capable of achieving what you want to do. And if you're not, you have to change your abilities. You know, or, um, I mean, you can s slow down or uh, bring down your ambitions. Both have to be adjusted so that you never are a failure in life. Yeah, we are Thank coming out with this model soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, anybody else? Yes, madam. So is it a time to say thank you to all? And goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, yes. Gurudev. God bless you. And I'll be very happy to come back to this university whenever you feel like. Chai Guru Dev. Oh, 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 what a brainstorming session it was. I'm sure every teacher who's sitting in this hall would be really now getting into the insight that why are we dealing with the students in this way? Isn't it? 
okay now we know actually why they are like they are <laughs> and uh, i guess now we have to do this brainstorming sessions with ourselves maybe we can just have uh, one accumulative uh, meeting where we can just identify that what could be done with this children and how we can deal with this new generation trends so thank you so much sir it was an eye opener uh, session especially for the teachers being a teacher i can just tell you that okay i have learned how to deal with my student and how to see them from the other dimension and uh, being a parent also i have learned actually that what uh, what i have to do with my my own daughter and how i have to deal with her now okay so thank you so much for the this eye opening session okay now uh, may i invite dr professor nikhil javeri sir the provost of the university to gives her a momento as a talk about respect thank you so much sir and we are so honored to have you here so Okay. May I request, uh, request now, uh, Dean of School of Technology, Dr. Saurabh Shah, for the vote of thanks. So, esteemed dignitaries on the dais, of the dais, invited guests, dear colleagues, and my dear student friends. good afternoon everyone so it is really my privilege to offer a word of thanks on behalf of gsfc university on very special special occasion of kshitij mega talk and uh, at the outset i express our sincere gratitude to very esteemed personality with us guru ji respected sri ajit telang sir for accepting our invitation and sparing your valuable time to deliver such a wonderful talk under kshitij Uh, sir it was eye opening enlightening thought provoking and insightful talk in fact like being teacher also we need to learn all the traits so i think uh, it's a, it has long way to go and lot of learning out of this so sir we are really blessed to have you sir thank you i also extend our sincere uh, gratitude to honorable president sri pk taneja sir for his continuous guidance and motivation for organizing such events i acknowledge and thank honorable uh, md of gsfc limited sri mukesh puri sir for his unstinted and uninterrupted support in all such activities special thanks to senior management uh, dr nikhil javeri sir provost gsfc university sri rb panchal sir director admin and registrar sri mahesh barot sir campus director and assistant director admin for their invaluable support in organizing this event I also express my gratitude to special invitees from GSFC Limited, uh, and also uh, we have online participants who are attending and listening us. We are also participants from uh, GACL, GGRC, so we are grateful to them, and uh, we also acknowledge their precious presence. I would like to specially thank uh, Mr. S. V. Dumal sir uh, for connecting connecting us to such a magnificent magnificent personality. and uh, we also appreciate the efforts of ms neha bajaj for organizing this event thanks to all offline online participants who are attending we have also students attending from classroom number 10 so we also duly acknowledge and thank them and at last i would like to thank it team for making it live and extending the it support and would also like to thank mr naren acharya and facility team for such a wonderful arrangements so i i once again thank you everyone for joining and we seek your blessing sir and please uh, bless us so frequently so that we are enlightened thank you sir thank you everyone please be seated let us all raise for the national anthem now जन गण मन अधिनायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता 
पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्तर बंगा विंध्य हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जगधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मांगे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे